I'm here at one of my favorite Civil War monuments, that to the Irish Brigade here at Gettysburg on Stony Hill near the Wheat Field and Devil's Den and further back, the Round Top. Now, by July of 1863, the Irish Brigade was well below its strength, and that had caused a number of political issues. At Antietam, they had taken casualties. Of course, they had taken tremendous casualties at their assault at Fredericksburg. And lastly, at Chancellorsville, that was the, the final straw for uh, General Thomas Marr. And Thomas Marr, of course, the famous Irish nationalist that had raised the Irish Brigade and was its first commander, um, resigned because they could not get sufficient replacements, could not get enough support from the War Department uh, or the state of New York. And they, uh, he resigned and uh, command passed to Colonel Kelly. And Colonel Kelly was in command at Gettysburg. Now, at Gettysburg, there were three New York regiments, uh, the 63rd, 69th, and 88th New York, that had um, consolidated and remained in the Irish Brigade. The 28th Massachusetts and 116th Pennsylvania were also part of the Irish Brigade, but they, most of them had been folded into the other regiments by this point. There were only about 600 men at Gettysburg in the Irish Brigade, and although they were small in number, they were still um, you know, important here, and they fought at the wheat field. They were um, notable for their 1842 smoothbores, which was actually a, a choice of Thomas Marr, um, who wanted them to be able to fire buck and ball, They'd be devastating at short range. That actually put them at a tremendous disadvantage. Uh, but that uh, we'll probably have to get into a discussion about that a different day. But the most important thing about this monument isn't really the 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 tactics of the performance of the Irish Brigade, but the symbolism and what it means to um, Irish service around the world and Irish Americans in general. It's a profoundly meaningful monument. It's a large Celtic cross, and it has at the bottom an Irish wolfhound. Um, and the Irish wolfhound, w w one thing that I find very interesting about the monument is that it actually has an inscription about the Irish wolfhound. And it says uh, by O'Donovan, who is actually the, the sculptor of the wolfhound, it says that the, the wolfhound has been extinct for more than 100 years. And for most of us today, we think, I, I've seen an Irish wolfhound, or I know they, they exist. But what happened was that throughout the 18th century and at the beginning of the 19th century, the new Irish wolfhounds were dwindling, were dying out. And it was seen as, you know, the death of uh, traditional Irish life for a lot of people. The wolves were gone, the wolfhounds were following. And so uh, by... 1888, when this monument was erected, the Irish Wolfhound was, for all intents and purposes, gone. Now, this still remains a hugely controversial subject in the dog world, but in the mid-19th century, seeing that the, the breed had died out um, in public circles, but not really believing that, that it was completely extinct, Captain Graham, an, an Englishman, a retired British Army captain, went about trying to find dogs that he felt were part of that original breed. And he had a theory on um, that the breed still existed, but it had um, diminished in its integrity. So he endeavored to recreate the traditional Irish wolfhound by mixing some of those dogs with the Scottish Deerhound, the Russian Borzai, with the Great Dane, and recreating through those pedigrees what he believed the original breed was. And so the modern Irish Wolfhound is a product of Graham's work. And that in itself is very controversial because this is an Englishman that says he has recreated an Irish dog breed. Some people still insist that the original Irish wolfhound is around. Some people still insist that it is completely extinct and this is just a facsimile, the closest thing we can get. And the Irish wolfhound really is hugely important to Irish culture, 
not only as a symbol of traditional life. Ku Cullen you know, became famous for slaying the, the Irish wolfhound. We know some of the early Celtic peoples used uh, wolfhounds in warfare. We know that the Irish wolfhound played a huge part uh, in s- traditional Irish society, protecting them from wolves. And when the wolves died out in the end, late 18th century, so too died that traditional life. So with Graham's work, we have a modern Irish wolfhound, but it might not necessarily be genetically exactly the same as the wolfhound that was thought to be extinct in the 19th century. In Captain Graham's own defense, he said in a monograph in 1879, that we are in possession of the breed and its original integrity is not pretended. At the same time, it is confidently believed that there are strains now existing tracing back more or less clearly to the original breed, and it also appears to be tolerably certain that our modern deer hound is descended from that noble animal. So it was controversial in the Victorian era, it's controversial today, and I'm sure someone can more eloquently talk about the history of the Irish wolfhound than me. The last thing I'll say about the Irish wolfhound here is that the people that erected this monument did think that the Irish wolfhound had been extinct and that a lot of the vestiges of traditional Irish life were gone. And so it's it's very poetic that this monument to fallen Irish heroes fighting for their new country in America features that loyal, noble Irish dog that they thought was extinct. Now, I love that someone has actually left a dog bone for our Irish wolfhound friend. It's just as important as leaving the uh, the the wreath. I, I, I love that someone actually cares about our wolfhound friend. So the other things to cover on this monument, um, of course, it has the service of the um, Irish Brigade, the infantry part of the Irish Brigade, and it also has um, the story with the 14th New York Independent Artillery. Now, in bronze on this side is the artillery, and then it lists each of the regiment's casualties here at Gettysburg, and of course it lists that it's 2nd Brigade, 1st Division of 2nd Corps. Now, this monument is 19 and a half feet tall, and it's marble, and on the front in bronze are the numbers of the different regiments, the 63rd, 69th, and 88th New York. And it has the um, seal of the state of New York. And, of course, at the bottom is the sun and the Irish harp supported by two eagles. This was, when it was erected in 1888, an important monument. And uh, Father Corby who also has a statue here at Gettysburg, was actually here for the dedication, and his words ring true today as they did in 1888. We have unveiled this pile, and it will stand to perpetuate the fame of those heroes. To keep their memory green in the American heart, this Celtic cross has been erected. It is an emblem of Ireland, typical of faith and devotion and the most appropriate that could be raised to hand down to posterity the bravery of our race in the great cause of American liberty. And that's Father William Corby. He was actually born in Michigan and taught at the University of Notre Dame before and after the war, actually became its president twice. And he's really famous for his absolution of the men before the battle, and that's been portrayed not only here in statue form, but in the movie Gettysburg. And he was a major figure, a minor celebrity in the Irish Brigade. The last quotation I want to leave you with also comes from that dedication ceremony in 1888. Above all, while they loved the green flag of Erin, whence they sprung, they upheld, with devoted, undying affection and loyalty, the stars and stripes of America, the country of their adoption. Captain William O'Grady, 88 New York. And that's the Irish Brigade Monument here at Gettysburg. 
Say goodbye to our doggo friend. <laughs>